Okay, welcome to today's ISM. This is the first ISM for this semester. We have a full agenda, so I will be passing this baton very uh, shortly to the students. But let me first let you guys know what the ISM is. It's an investment strategy meeting, and the goal here is for uh, our officers to share some information, and then even we like to share sometimes one or two uh, research reports. So today, uh, our president, Ryan Nichols will go over some of the performance that's going on. He's going to stay a little bit clear of the strategic fund today because if you look on the, I think it's the third slide, it won't show up here. Uh, I added a couple slides there on the handout. You'll see our board of directors. I've recently gone over with uh, the Small Fund Advisory Board. I've gone over um, some ideas that we have, and we're going to try ch change up the strategic fund a good bit and hopefully have a lot of information about that at the next ISM. So he's gonna tell you a little bit about the performance, but they're gonna talk mainly today about the traditional fund. The traditional fund is an all equity fund that is compared to the S&P 500. And so you will see a lot of, of relative comparisons to that nature. And then Grant will do what's often one of the more interesting parts of the presentation, our macro outlook, where we're going to go over a, a little bit of what's happened recently, what's going on now, and what might happen here in the near future. Um, we then, our VP of risk management, Nick, uh, will go over some basic risk management stuff and also let you know what's some differences between the fund and, and the benchmark. And uh, finally, Trent is going to give us a sample of the bottoms up research that we do, and he's going to cover this stock ASML. So with that uh, being said, I'd like to go ahead and hand this over to the captain. Take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you joining us for our first ISM of the semester. I am uh, Ryan Nichols. I am the president and chief investment strategist of the Smile Fund, and today I'll be sharing our performance update. So we currently manage a little bit more than $923,000, which is separated into the two funds. Uh, the traditional fund, which makes up about 60% of total assets, focuses on large cap domestic equities, and the remaining 40% is in the strategic fund, uh, which is comprised of small, mid, and large cap stocks, some international stocks, and some sector ETFs. The traditional fund is benchmarked against the S&P 500, and since the inception of the traditional fund in 2015, it has had a total return of about 153%, roughly in line with the S&P 500. And this translates to about a 12% annualized return. And the strategic fund is benchmarked against a 25% equally weighted small, mid, large cap, and international indices. And since its inception in 2018, the fund returned about 46%, which is about 8.1% on an annualized basis. Keeping, keeping with the uh, strategic fund for a second, uh, year to date, the strategic fund returned about 11.2% compared to the blended benchmarks 12.18%, uh, which is about 1% underperformance. And uh, shifting back to the traditional fund, uh, year to date, the traditional fund uh, has returned 17.5%, while the S&P 500 has returned almost 19%. And this brings year to date underperformance to 1.43%. Uh, so diving deeper into performance, uh, this chart shows the top contributions to relative return. And to be clear, the uh, the average relative weight is showing our over or underweight in that holding relative to the benchmark, and the right-hand column is relative contribution to return. Notably, our top three names, Salesforce, Eli Lilly, and FedEx, are also within our top 10 highest relative weighted holdings, uh, meaning our largest deviations from the benchmark. Uh, while we have underperformed this year, uh, we, we are pleased uh, that our highest conviction ideas have been some of our best performers. Specifically in the case of Salesforce and FedEx, these are names which disproportionately, which got hit disproportionately last year. And we researched these names further and saw an evaluation opportunity in those names. And so we rebalanced into those and put more weight into them. Um, and this chart kind of illustrates what we're wanting to do in the traditional fund. Uh, we want to utilize our best research to form our highest conviction ideas, and with those ideas, uh, act boldly on them. 
And before we get to our bottom relative performers, I want to uh, review a recent trade request that we've been creating, uh, which will be executed uh, this week. Uh, first, we did trim some of our large active weight in Eli Lilly um, as the valuation um, is questionable for a pharmaceuticals company has increased substantially this year. Um, and so we kind of want to assess the research there, update the research, and see if we still believe that this valuation is justified. Uh, we also sold Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and with that weight, we uh, increased our holding or weight in Merck, Johnson & Johnson, and HCA Healthcare. Um, and then next, we trimmed Salesforce for a similar reason to Eli Lilly. Uh, this company has had a large uh, increase this year, um, mainly based of, on multiple expansion. Um, and so we wanted to decrease some of that active weight that we have um, and update the research. Uh, we also sold uh, Chenier and uh, moved that weight to uh, Chevron. And lastly, we did sell Pinnacle Financial and increased our weighting in Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway. Next, this chart shows the bottom five relative contributors to return. Um, and uh, just to be clear here, um, we, on the average relative weight, we do not own any NVIDIA or Tesla. And so this is showing our relative contribution to return because we don't own them uh, has been uh, poor. Um, so the last or the fourth and fifth companies are healthcare and uh, we can continue to be overweight the sector however as i said earlier um, we will be selling uh, jazz pharmaceuticals and most notably as i just mentioned um, uh, the bottom contrib contributors to a relative return have been companies that we are either underweight or hold no weight in uh, we do not hold NVIDIA as te or Tesla, and we have been underweight Apple. And, and not owning NVIDIA on a relative basis um, has contributed a relative uh, negative uh, 286 basis points to return. Um, and, and this kind of illustrates some of the important themes that have been happening in the market this year. Uh, so I included this chart, uh, which shows the year-to-date performance of an equal-weighted S&P 500 in blue and the normal market cap-weighted S&P 500 in yellow. And similar to last year, markets have been weighing the probabilities of the Fed's policy path and the extent to which this policy path will affect the economy. However, in the second half of this year, generative AI took the stage as perhaps the most dominant market theme. As you can see, in the second half, or in the first, in the first half of this year, second quarter, these two indices had a large deviation. Uh, the largest names in the index, uh, primarily the ones that you saw in the chart before, uh, we're contributing almost to almost all of the return year to date. And while there are other factors, the markets re began repricing the potential productivity and demand gains which generative AI could bring. And we view that this theme is imperative to be both conscious or to be conscious of for both opportunity and for risk's sake. And moving forward, we will allocate time and research uh, to AI and its potential beneficiaries. And we also plan to be conscious of the risks which regard to the concentration of market performance. And in June, uh, market breadth widened. Um, and, and this year, the Fed has made meaningful progress in their fight in, uh, against inflation. And nevertheless, the economy has been subjected to massive shifts in policy in recent years. And there's an uncertainty about how these uh, shifts will uh, uh, impact the economy, but with that, uh, unless there are any questions, I'm going to turn it over to Grant for the macro. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I believe that's. I believe that's the case. Yes. Any other questions? All right. I will turn that over to Grant. Good afternoon, my name is Grant Fetters and I am the new VP of Market Analysis. Today I will be presenting our market outlook. In order to establish our outlook, I will begin by outlining what has happened, what is currently unfolding, and how these developments will guide our strategy moving forward. We know the Federal Reserve continues to remain committed to 2% inflation. Nevertheless, monetary policy operates with long and variable lags, a principle that applies to both accommodative and restrictive policy. 
In response to challenges created by the pandemic, significant fiscal and monetary measures were deployed. It is important to understand fiscal and monetary measures function on different timescales. Accommodative policies such as the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIP Act, and the CARES Act all acted as stimulus supporting economic growth. Certain accommodative policies that were implemented due to COVID are now reverting back to neutral policy, one prominent example being student loan forbearance. Although some fiscal policy continues to be accommodative, their intended impact is to be captured over a more extended time horizon. Now policy shifts from pri primarily accommodative to mainly restrictive. We have now seen the Fed raise policy rates 525 basis points to combat inflation. While this restrictive policy filters through the economy, risks to economic growth remain. The rise of inflation was primarily driven by the heightened demand being met with supply chain issues. The Fed implemented restrictive policy to combat inflation, which has meaningfully declined. The chart of headline CPI, a measure of inflation, shows each inflationary component. Now, some segments which contributed to disinflation this year have upside risks, such as energy prices. OPEC in Russia recently announced a three-month voluntary cut in production of oil. Just this morning, month-over-month -month CPI data rose 0.6% in August. Core CPI year-over-year -year declined 4.3% declined to 4.3%. The largest contributor to the monthly increase for all items was gasoline. We will continue to monitor energy prices due to its potential risks. The Fed's preferred measure of inflation, PCE, is above their 2% target. The Fed is primar primarily concerned with core services X housing. This excludes volatile food and energy and the lagged housing data. This leaves core services X housing, which is primarily driven by labor costs. The chart on the left shows the job openings in blue and the Atlanta Fed, Fed wage growth index in yellow. Number of job openings has declined off its peak along with wage growth. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate continues to hover at historically low levels. We can observe the trends in labor data. In the past, businesses' demand for labor was met with a low supply of workers. More recently, as the supply and demand for labor has come closer into balance, wage growth has moderated. The Fed has projected that supply and demand in the labor market will need to come further back into balance for inflation to reach 2%, based on their summary of economic projections. The summary of economic projections shows the Fed is comfortable with unemployment getting to 4.5% while inflation trends back down to 2%. The market expectations are closely aligned with the Fed's expected policy path. We expect that the Fed will not be able to get inflation back down to 2% sustainably without further loosening in the labor market, which the Fed agrees with based on their SEP. To the extent inflation remains sticky and above 2%, the less likely the Fed is to cut. Current data regarding economic growth and outlook continues to tell a conflicting story. The past year has presented manufacturing PMI at contractionary levels, but services PMI at expansionary levels. Earlier this year, we underestimated the resilience of the consumer. Continual demand for services has allowed services PMI to expand. Segments of manufacturing, specifically new orders and inventory levels, are contracting faster than previous readings. Furthermore, leading economic indicators have continued to decline year over year, but coincident indicators continue to grow. We continue to see mixed data due to prior stimulative policy measures. And while coincident indicators continue to grow and leading indicators continue to decline, we remain conscious of the risks to economic growth. Over the past year, we underestimated the impact of accommodative monetary and fiscal policy. For instance, student loan forbearance is just now ending. Excess household savings from direct stimulus is now depleting. In the chart, estimated excess savings as, measure, as measured by the Fed are just now dissipating. The San Francisco Fed also projects excess household savings to, to be depleted this quarter. Past policy actions stimulated the demand for goods and have continued to act as stimulants. We also overestimated the timeliness of the impact of restrictive policy. The consumer was able to continually spend throughout quarter one and two of 2023. Now, as restrictive policy takes hold, we believe there may be risk to consumer demand. In summary, there has been a massive shift in policy over the past few years. As restrictive policy filters through the economy, risks remain for economic growth. We expect that some implications of this shift will be discretionary spending being pressured and the higher cost of capital weighing in on business investment. 
While we have these expectations, we continue to be slightly defensively positioned. And moving forward, we want our macro research to be more focused on how the current environment affects our portfolio and how it could dictate our selection. We will focus research on companies with established economic moats and while looking for opportunities in secular trends. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think when it comes to the manufacturing PMI and inventory levels sort of contracting faster, it is something that I want to look into on, in terms of paying attention to manufacturing PMI growing as inventories are restocked in the coming year. Um, and that, that, that goes the same for LEI as well, just paying attention to that. For those of you that want your voice projected when you ask a question, just raise your hand and I will bring around the microphone. For those of you with a voice like Ray, you might not need it. But yeah, yeah. It's this room's a little bit different than the Raccoon Mountain room, especially as you get up there. They they may not even be able to hear Ray. So uh, if if and and as we record, I think Sarah might say it might pick up on the recorder on the on the recording device better as well. So. Let's try it out. And we'll be in the Raccoon Mountain room again next time. So if this is kind of awkward, so be it. Okay. Uh, I don't need it. <laughs> so be it. Uh, yes. So on the, on the LEI, normally it's the 17 CE or something like that that go into it. And if you're looking for uh, where those bumps are coming, it's not that because it's in Bangor. I'm not really a, personally a big fan of it. Because it's got so many series and you know it goes in. Uh, I wanted a clarification on your next slide where you were talking about economic moments. You're concluding now. Sorry. Okay. So continue to be slightly defensively positioned. Could you clarify that? Yeah, I think where our portfolio currently is, um, specifically our overweights in um, healthcare, um, those sectors have been beaten up and in terms of sector rotation we do believe that our stock selection in our overweights we believe in those based on our research and those are those sectors are considered more defensive um, Nick will touch on that but I believe it's 0.93 or 0.91 depending on whether or not you count the cash it's 0.93 or 0.91 if you count the cash There you go, Christian. Thanks for the update. Um, do you uh, do you think the Fed will follow through and do what and stick to that two percent stated goal, or do you think they'll blink before the, before that? 
recently Jerome Powell stated he had the opportunity to change his view on 2% and he doubled down and said we will we are persistent on getting back to 2%. So we'll, we'll be paying attention to what the Fed has to say, but right now we're we're under the view that they want to stick to 2% and we'll continue to do so. And then just uh just to follow up to Bento's question on um uh, defensively positioned um, one of your big overweights, I think, is Staples, yeah? Correct. And, um, you know, they've obviously had to they've either benefit or not, depending on the time frame, from the inflationary environment, and have, you know, taking pricing, and then as, as pricing has become, or as uh, input costs have become a little bit more sticky, they've uh, realized some margin improvement. How, how do you see them navigating if, if, you know, we were to see a true decline in inflation? and a reduction in some of those input costs. Will pricing be sticky, I guess? Uh, I guess more succinctly, uh, with all the pricing that uh, Staples companies have taken in response to inflation uh, in input prices, um, how sticky do you think pricing will be on the downside if if you start to see some of the economic weakness that you um you're you're uh you're forecasting and perhaps some of the some of the some decline in demand for some of those underlying commodities Now, I'll go as well. Uh, two quick questions here. One, I think the Chicago Fed recently put out a paper highlighting that based on the data uh, they have, uh, they believe a soft landing can be achieved in which inflation can come down to target without significant, uh, you know, a recession or significant unemployment. Obviously, next week we'll have the Fed speaking again. I think most people don't think that they'll do anything in terms of a rate hike, but they will adjust their SEP that you hit on. Um, if they bring unemployment lower and or GDP higher, does that change how the portfolio is managed? I think paying attention to Fed policy and right now what the market is pricing in is not a, to maintain rates at, at this next meeting. Um, with the data points that we are looking at and it being somewhat of conflicting, um, we plan on paying attention to it and making adjustments. And if unemployment is, you know, if they project unemployment to stay low, um, it's, it, I mean, it's something we're going to pay attention to for sure.
right now we're slightly, uh, conservative word, you could even say slightly bearish in character is the market. <coughs> Another way of ask, asking that question is, what would make you more bullish in the market is, is from a macro standpoint. Is there anything that y'all are paying attention to that would say, okay, we've got to adjust the beta here or change our sector? Right. And one last quick question. I didn't hear the word China come out of your mouth. Um, thoughts on that and impacts, given uh, how much impact it has on the overall market? Um, we're, we are paying attention to China, and they are having some deflation. Um, and what that effect will have on exports, again, coming back to manufacturing PMI, if inventories are to restock, that could be good for our economy, and that again, that's why we're going to continue to pay attention to the PMIs. Um, and China might, if those goods are exported, affect uh, the restocking of inventory levels. So, Um, this probably hits on these same points, but I submitted these comments as you guys got ready for this. And just curious, I'm going to put you on the spot, Grant. Can you go back up to the Fed funds implied probability path? Yeah. So, okay, we take the Fed at its word, and in, by 2025, inflation will not be at two percent. Therefore, they will still have a tightening bias, right? So, based on that. Their projections, we shouldn't expect a rate cut in the next 15 months, whereas the market is already priced in four. So these two charts conflict. And one of them has to be really wrong, and one of them has to be really right. So what's the expectation of small fund? Who's right and who's wrong? And then what's the market adjustment going to look like? So if you look at the chart on the left, it basically says that the Fed is going to, the market believes the Fed's going to cut rates over four times, so basically by a full percentage point. The chart on the right says that they will not be at their inflation target by the end of 2025. How do you know that? 
how do you know that they intend to cut rates? Why do you suspect that they will cut rates? No, I understand that that's what's there. I understand that they've that that's in the SEP projection. But does that not conflict with what they've been saying? Okay. I mean something about this there's it's not adding up. 1 plus 1 can't equal 3. So there's aspects of the SEP which are lacking credibility. The market has been aggressive about pricing and rate cuts. My question to you is ignoring all this if the market's prepared for rate cuts and wants four of them next year and the fed doesn't deliver what's the adjustment you're you're saying the the stock market would correct Okay. So then we're back to the bearish view. Based on this. So this is disregarding a soft landing scenario. In a in a soft landing they're not going to cut rates four times. See my point? Correct. But I will say, and I think Ray has maybe has thrown you a little bit of a lifeline for staying slightly conservative if you don't believe that there's actually going to be four uh, rate cuts next year. Any, any other questions for Grant or Ryan? All right, well, we can take more questions later, but we'll continue for now. Go ahead, Grant. All right, are you, you're done, right? I am. I'll turn it over to Nick for, okay. for him to go over risk management. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Morris, and I am the Vice President of Risk Management and Chief Industrials Analyst for the Smile Fund. Today, I'll be presenting the Risk Management Outlook for the Traditional Fund. The year-to-date total return for the traditional fund as of September 1st was 17.5%, representing 1.43% relative underperformance compared to the S&P 500, which is our benchmark. The traditional fund also had a beta of 0.91 when factoring in cash drag, compared to the benchmark beta of 1. These two metrics, along with a three-month treasury yield, yielded the traditional fund a trainer ratio of 0.12. While we underperformed from a total return perspective, we were approximately even with the benchmark from a risk-adjusted return perspective. The following securities represent the top 10 weighted holdings for the traditional fund and their corresponding weightings in the benchmark. All of our top 10 weighted holdings, with the exceptions of Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon, represent names which we have material positive deviations from the benchmark. Furthermore, in the upcoming trade request, we plan to increase our Amazon weighting causing us to have a positive deviation from the benchmark in Amazon as well. As of September 1st, we were overweight healthcare, 
financials, and consumer staples relative to our benchmark. Our positions in these sectors have become more overweight throughout the year due to owning stocks which outperformed the sector overall, meaning that these sectors grew as a percentage of our portfolio relative to the benchmark. We were underweight information technology and consumer discretionary. Our positions in these sectors have become more underweight throughout the year due to be being underweight the high-performing names which made these sectors grow as a percentage of the benchmark. Our year-to-date relative performance is due to a negative allocation effect of minus 3.13% and a positive selection effect of 2.12%. Our negative allocation effect is due to being underweight high-performing sectors such as information technology and communication services. It is also due to being overweight poor-performing sectors such as consumer staples and healthcare. Fortunately, our negative allocation effect is partially offset by our positive selection effect. Our positive selection effect is due to being overweight, high-performing names in consumer staples, healthcare, and industrials, but is partially diminished by being underweight, high-performing names in consumer discretionary and information technology. Overall, our top-performing sector was industrials, with a total attribution of 1.36%, and our bottom-performing sector was information technology, with a total attribution of minus 1.85%. Um, yes. There were two names that really benefited to our selection effect in industrials that will be covered in the next slide. Our top relative performers year to date represent positive deviations from the benchmark in high performing names and highlight our top selections. Our positive selection effect in consumer staples is highlighted by being overweight Walmart and Constellation brands. Our positive selection effect in industrials is highlighted by being overweight FedEx and A.O. Smith, and our positive selection effect in healthcare is highlighted by being overweight Eli Lilly and HCA Healthcare. Overall, our top 10 relative performers contributed 8.66 percentage points of relative performance. Year to date, 61% of the total positive return of our benchmark comes from six companies. Our bottom 10 relative performers table reveals that we are underweight four of these companies, NVIDIA, Tesla, Apple, and Meta. The remaining list primarily consists of poor performing names in the healthcare and financial sectors, which we are overweight in. We were overweight Cigna, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, United Healthcare, and Pinnacle Financial Partners. Each of these names have performed poorly year to date and have further contributed to relative underperformance. We plan to sell Pinnacle Financial Partners and Jazz Pharmaceuticals in our upcoming trade request. Overall, our bottom 10 relative performers contributed minus 6.93 percentage points of relative performance. As for our overall risks to relative performance moving forwards, a few trends stand out. An unexpected acceleration in consumer demand will increase the performance of the consumer discretionary sector, a sector which we are underweight in. If this, we, if this were to happen, we would underperform unless we were to reallocate a higher weighting towards the consumer discretionary sector. Our overweight positioning in pharmaceuticals leaves us vulnerable due to the highly competitive nature of the pharmaceuticals market. If the names we hold lose their competitive advantage, we run the risk of further relative underperformance. Finally, being underweight emerging technologies has caused us to underperform year to date. As excitement around AI has been driving some of the top performing names year to date, being underweight this market leaves us vulnerable to further underperformance. As Ryan mentioned earlier, we will be devoting more research towards this topic. Thank you. Amazon's being added to the trade request partly because we believe in Amazon. I'll let Ryan further clarify on that.
current weight's about two and a quarter. Yes. <laughs> And I raised that point to Nick yesterday in the lab, and he actually t said something I thought was quite smart. He said, yes, our total weight will be higher by, uh, in Apple by holding Berkshire Hathaway. But he said, but compared to the benchmark, it won't change that much because the benchmark has Berkshire Hathaway as well. So I thought that was a pretty good point. And if two main points from, uh, from what Nick went over that I think we should see is, one, the students are doing really good research, and their bottom-up research has gotten better, in my opinion, and that, I think that's showing. They're, their you know, sector allocation did not do well. Had there been a recession or a slowdown, they, there would have been quite a bit of outperformance because they would have done well in, in both. Um, but to, more to the stock selection, what they're pointing out here is that those companies that they hold the highest conviction in, meaning the most weight in, performed the best. And the ones that they're only got like half a percent or one percent in are, are the ones that didn't do as well. And so I'm asking them to maybe follow their own convictions a little bit more strongly and hold fewer stocks. Uh, still have enough for diversification, so, but maybe get rid of the five or 10 that are in there with a half percent or 1%. And so that's something that we're looking into. But I think that both of those kind of came out of some of the um, charts and, and tables that Nick put together. Uh, having said that, is there a reason why if the sector selection is poor, historically that you would choose to have sector selection be part of the portfolio construction? Why wouldn't you just equal weight it against the... Yeah, so I'll answer this because I've got, I know the history a little bit better. Actually, until about two years ago, it, it was the sector allocation that consistently outperformed the stock selection. Uh, I think what we're seeing here is that the students did and, and, you know, they're trying to use their education, but they have, right? So I think they put a lot of faith into these leading indicators, and we're getting to teach a lesson of how correlation doesn't mean causation. And so a lot of these leading indicators did suggest that there could be a downturn in the economy. And so I think that they, they've went with those convictions, which I'd rather go with convictions than nothing. And it turned out that it, it didn't work out that way, at least not yet. And so, you know, that's part of why we do what we do. Yes. Our primary holdings in financials consist of, currently it's Visa, Berkshire, and Pinnacle, but we are selling Pinnacle to get even further into Berkshire Hathaway. We have had strong convictions on those two companies, and on our top 10 relative performers, Visa showed up on the list, and we're believing that Berkshire will be showing up on that list soon as well. Bottom line is still the large of these two is non bank spending on services and yes. You may have some other bank exposure which doesn't seem to make a significant difference, but in terms of fifty to the other twenty or so things like that. Sorry. 
Hey, can I just ask a question on how you determine position sizing? And particularly if you look at relative weight, uh, I mean, kudos on the Salesforce pick. That's awesome. It's doubled year to date. Uh, but I think it's valuations like 150 times and you have three X, most of these name two X, uh, the relative weight bet on this one. So how do you think about that as, you know, as you've been successful and, you know, is there some price target? It's just the you know, it should be $500 stock and it's a double from here? Or how do we think about that? And then last question was what what happened on jazz? I mean, it would have been like your fourth largest relative position uh, to I know it underperformed a little bit, but what's the what's the driver of the sell? Yeah. First of all, you know, you've probably answered this in other meetings, this first one I've been to, so I apologize for that. But having sit in a portfolio manager's position for, you know, many, many years, it's easy for people like me to sit up here and ask you th these questions. But as a PM, that's what you get used to. So when I was looking at the presentation, one of the questions that I had was looking at basically the bets you've made on the video. And you've probably touched on that, but looking at that, you know, especially when you have something that's been this hot, you know, you have people, in this case, the UC Foundation or your clients that would be asking, well, why don't, why don't we own this? And, and, you know, or at least own some of it. And anyway, that was just the question. I will say that there's about seven to eight stocks that now represent more than one two percent of the market. And we had a discussion due to NVIDIA being one of those now, one of the biggest companies in the market, that yet we aren't allowed to short, but we are in a way effectively shorting uh, these stocks if we're not, if we're not holding as much as the market does. Because 
position when compared relative to the, to the benchmark. So although we, we're not technically shorting, we are relatively shorting the video by not taking a position at all. And furthermore, we need to say, well, in that space, is there something we like more than the video? And that's actually one of the reasons. We'll, we'll play catch up here, but that's one of the reasons ASML is so important. Any other questions? I think what I heard there is that your your position is bearish on the video. Is that correct? Oh, thank you. So, so hold on, Ray. Uh, Hold on, before you answer that, it's a couple people didn't hear that. So Ray's point is that going forward is the main point that they're still uh, too bearish or a little bit bearish. That's the risk, the main risk. Okay. So they're going to bring it back up at the next ISM if, <laughs> if you haven't uh, thought about it more. Okay. Vinod. Great, great point. Just a couple quick ones to touch on. Uh, I think some of the questions that have been asked just really suggestive in nature. Uh, one is, you know, you mentioned kind of how do you keep track of price targets and justify holding things when they run up. I, I would just make a suggestion that whenever something materially changes or you get a, a new quarter that you you update the model accordingly and that, that you know, you have a, a, a current price price on the on the desk, so to speak. And um, second is if it gets to that price that you have some sort of a meeting to, um, you know, to to justify it. And then lastly, to the NVIDIA question, um, I would agree with you that just because something's in the index doesn't mean you take a position in it. But there are certain times where you miss certain names. And, um, you know, it's probably always helpful, I don't know on what frequency, um, given that a lot of you graduate and all that, but um, you know, you might conduct some sort of a missed opportunities uh, exercise of some kind, and maybe keep that living for future classes of students, so that the fund can continue to learn both from mistakes and also things you guys have done right. Didn't we establish a procedure of firm price targets and that when the stock reached the price target, there was a automatic review for rebalance? Have we gotten away from that a little bit? Uh, we've done it twice and then we've got new officer groups and it's and faded away. But okay. what, I, what I've asked. So 
those uh, procedures are there. Yeah, the procedures are there, and, and uh, I think COVID uh, put us uh, on a little bit autopilot where we weren't going as, as doing everything that we were supposed to be doing. But um, one thing, one one idea I've talked to some of the officers about is to uh, for each ISM is to provide you a piece of paper that has all of our holdings with our, with our current and our current price targets so that that is forcing us to set to have all of that updated for each ism and then i think that that exercise can help take care of some of the some of the problems we've been having right right it is in, yeah in combination with the vp of fundamental analysis that was they're supposed to work together on that and so we're gonna try to bring that back up so nick that might be something that uh gives you a little bit more ammo for your for your position going forward. So, anything else? If not, this concludes the uh, officer portion and we're gonna have Trent come up and uh, talk a little bit about ASML. And um, it, it, I think it's a really interesting holding. Um, the At the end, if you have other questions for the officers too, you can bring those back up as well. So. Hello, my name is Trent Lowe, and I'm here to talk to you guys about ASML holding. ASML has a current stock price of $618.80 with a market cap of $268.5 billion as of September 12th, 2023. I have calculated a target price of $709.50, an upside potential of 15%. ASML is a world leader in microchip manufacturing. They manufacture the most advanced lithography systems in the world and they are an essential step in the semiconductor manufacturing process. The semiconductor supply chain starts with high-end suppliers such as ASML, who sell equipment to semiconductor manufacturers such as TSMC, Samsung, or Intel, who then sell these manufactured semiconductors to large tech companies such as NVIDIA, Apple, Google, Dell, or IBM. ASML EUV machines create the most advanced semiconductors in the world. EUV stands for extreme ultraviolet light. This is different from their competitors who operate in deep ultraviolet light spaces. AI expectations could drive further demand for fabrication plants for ASML. ASML's large research and development budget keeps it ahead of the competition. ASML is the only company in the world that can make EUV manufacturing systems. On the graph here, we can see the difference between an ASML EUV technology machine versus a competitor's DUV lithography system. The difference is the EUV system has the ability to produce smaller chips, or the space between transistors on chips becomes smaller. This is important because it increases the transistor density and makes the chip have higher processing power. EUV manufacturing allows for more defined cuts to be made on computer chips. In this picture here, we can see a seven nanometer chip produced using one RFI DUV machine and an EUV machine. The smoother lines, the more defined lines, means more efficient data transfer between, in the chip. It also means less data loss. This is why EUV technology is better than the DUV technology. These EUV systems operate at wavelengths of 13.5 nanometers, while their competitors have similar DUV machines that operate at wavelengths between 248 and 183 nanometers. This is important because as the wavelengths get smaller, you can place transistors closer together, meaning higher density and more processing power on the same size chip. The H100 integrated circuit is a chip made by TSMC. This NVIDIA design chip runs 70% of AI systems. TSMC manufactures these chips using ASML's hardware. As such, ASML is planning to work with TSMC to make a new fabrication plant in Taiwan that will fulfill AI-driven demand for these new two nanometer chips. To a single fab, it depends what the size of the fab is. No more than five or six EUV machines per fabrication plant, just because these machines are the size of a room. What's the price difference between an EUV and a DUV? 
a DUV machine can cost around 80 to 150 million, depending on if you buy a used or older system, while EUV systems cost upwards of $200 million each. Research and development. In 2022, ASML spent $3.54 billion on research and development. Ex they have a new generation of experimental EUV technology that has the ability to mass produce two nanometer chips. ASML's research and development budget is much larger than its competitors out of the total revenue, meaning they spend more on research and development out of their total revenue than any of their competitors. And this is mostly confined to the EUV technology, while the competitors spend more time trying to streamline the production of less powerful chips in the DUV space. Uh, applied is applied materials is around the same size as ASML. ASML is larger than LAM and Tokyo. The semiconductor market is expected to grow by over one trillion dollars by 2030. On this graph, we can see the increase from 1987 to 2023 in the global semiconductor market. Of this market, the global semiconductor manufacturing equipment was 83 billion dollars in 2022. This is expected to grow further in 2023 to be between 84.3 billion and 90 billion. I've seen different estimates depending on which sources you use. In 2022, ASML made $16.56 billion in net system sales. This is not their total revenue. This is just the manufacturing equipment section of their revenue. Yeah, it was a 10.1% CAGR. Competitive positioning. ASML has the highest current ROE in 2023. This is seen in the trends section. However, their 2022 return on equity was lower than their competitors. In the past year, their ROE has increased while their competitors ROE has decreased. ASML has the highest profit margins when compared to their competitors. This has been trending upwards from the last six months, and I expect there to be even more gains made in this section. Their, total, their average asset tone turnover is smaller than their competitors. This is because ASML operates with EUV technology. It is much more complex to manufacture these systems than it is to manufacture a deep ultraviolet lithography system. They can't turn out as many of these machines as deep ultraviolet, but they are more expensive, meaning higher profit margins. They do also sell the UV machines. Most of their system sales come from EUV technology, and then DUV is broken up into a couple different types of machines based on what type of chips you want to manufacture. That comes to, they, I'm going to talk about that on, the, I think, either the next slide, but EUV systems account for 45% of the sales of net system sales, while DUV accounts for the rest. ASML's EUV technology sets them ahead of the competition. No other company in the world has the ability to make this technology, and that is why I believe that they are in a good space if you're wanting to get into semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Risk factors. I say the biggest risk for ASML is its business cyclicality. The large, it is very volatile when compared to its competitors in the market. This means that it is an additional risk to the fund. Taiwan's geopolitical factors are also a big risk for ASML. If China were to invade Taiwan, Taiwan and China combined make around 40% of ASML's revenue. That would be at risk. However, the probability of this happening is relatively low. AI overestimates. If AI were to not, ex not exceed or come to par with what the market predicts AI will look like in a year, this isn't a huge slump in ASML's revenue. They still need to manufacture more EUV machines just for the natural demand. So if, a if AI wasn't to be a, as big of a revenue driver as the market predicts it to be, it's not going to be detrimental, but it will have a slump. And the successfulness of research and development. 
if ASML isn't allocating their resources to the right types of technology, or they are resort or researching different types of technology, and their competitors come up with a new way to manufacture semiconductors, this could mean that ASML falls behind the competition. However, I don't believe this to be true. They have had really good tests with their new experimental units, and I believe that they will have greater success when manufacturing large amounts of small nanometer chips. Yeah. Yeah. Do you when you make a high-end semiconductor with a DUV machine, it becomes really complex. It's hard to manufacture machines with a low defect rate. You have to throw out a lot of different semiconductors. So the semiconductors in your laptops and phones are all operate on wave. They are built with ASML's machines. They have small spaces between the transistors on the chips, which means we're always going to need higher-end chips just to keep up with how technology is progressing. So it's, we're always gonna see more demand. Semiconductor systems represent 70% of revenue. And of the 70% of revenue, EUV systems account for 48% of these system sales. Here we can see the EUV section of their system revenue, the other RFI, ARFDRI, and KRF machines are all different ways of just different classifications of deep ultraviolet lithography systems. They are they account for most of their revenue. However, these are less complicated to make. And when EUV sales do slump, ASML has proven to be able to bump the capacity to build DUV machines on order. However, their system, ma their system maintenance service accounts for 30% of their remaining revenue. When their machines breaks or they need to replace a part, they'll get a call from the manufacturers and they will go replace and fix that part and that accounts for the last 30% of revenue. ASML's revenue is estimated to grow by 25.6%. This is according to the one-year CAGR projection. Not, not exactly. I don't know how profitability works with their system service. I didn't go in depth on that. I went more into the manufacturing of the systems themselves. Backlog and net income. As you can see from this chart, ASML has a backlog of orders. It has increased dramatically between 2021 and 2022. This can be attributed to rising costs and they were, it was easier to have a backlog of orders than to make them on demand. ASML also has a steadily growing net income year over year, with the exception of 2022 due to supply chain issues and heightened costs. My DCF valuation. For my DCF valuation, I estimated that the terminal growth rate would be 3.3% due to high involvement in Asian countries such as Taiwan that have higher historical GDP growth. With a five-year weekly adjusted beta of 1.1, I calculated the WAC to be 10.46%, coming to a target price of $681.34, with a potential upside of 9%. I did a sensitivity analysis for my DCF to show that with any minor change in the terminal growth rate or the interim growth rate, that most of ASML's potential target prices will still be a positive gain. The relative valuation here is based off of the DUV section. I could not do a relative valuation on any of their close competitors in the EUV market because they are, ASML is the only company in the world that manufactures EUV technology. However, in the DUV lithography section, they do have a, a pretty decent relative valuation. Their EUV is their main focus. However, the DUV does comprise mo the majority of their system sales. Oh. And that is what I wanted to focus on with this relative valuation. For this relative valuation, I did an EV to EBITDA analysis, and I, had to ca and I calculated the equity value with a price of sales analysis.
my conclusion. I said the development of AI and AI-driven demand will boost revenues for ASML. And I also believe that ASML's EUV technology gives them an unmatched competitive advantage when compared to companies such as LAM Research or Tokyo Electron. I said that ASML's research and development programs will protect them from any unexpected outside advancements in lithography technology. Thank you. All right, so I, my final conclusion, by using a 70-30 blended valuation for my target price for ASML is $709.05 with, with an upside potential of 15%. All right, great job. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Quick question. So you you got a slide on? You got a slide on backlog. Yeah. Was that backlog from EUV or from the EUV? It was combined. I don't have them split up. Most of it was the EUV technology. It is harder to make. That means there's more backlog. And I do have an exact figure on the backlog. In 20, let me look here. In, at the end of 2023, their backlog was $40 billion. And by the end of 2023, it's expected to be $48 billion. However, according to ASML's website or their 10K, they're expecting this backlog to decline by 2025 as they start ramping up more production. Are, yeah, are they increasing, increasing capacity? Yeah, they're making more fabrication, not, yeah, fabrication plants to make more of these machines. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know what the return on research capital is. Sure. I said that the backlog of orders have been growing steadily for the past seven years. Their backlog at the end of 2022 was $40 billion. The current estimates for backlogs at the end of 2023 are $48 billion. And the net income has been steadily increasing year over year, with the exception of 2022. Yes. It was easier for them to have a backlog of orders in 2022 due to heightened costs of manufacturing the machines and shipping them due to the supply chain issues. So that's why we can see the huge jump in backlogs from 2021 to 2022. Yeah. No, that was not priced into the stock. Yes, there will be a big drop in orders. However, those orders could also increase if there is more demand for AI. The, the, after they get rid of their backlog, as it starts to go down, more orders could continue to come in depending on what demand is like in the future. That's hard to really tell right now. I don't know what demand is going to exactly look like in 2025 when they start whittling down their backlog. Trent, we could... We could try to work that into a, a bear and bull case scenario okay. and, and see if we can get a, a, a range, a sense of what that might look like. All right. Sure. Yes. 
Yeah, the bear case could be that their growth rate is a lot slower depending on what demand looks like in the future. With that, a target price would be considerably lower for ASML. However, I don't entirely think that this is going to, that is going to happen. I think there's always going to be more demand for these machines as more companies switch from deep ultraviolet technology to extreme ultraviolet technology. Just because as technology advances, we're going to need more powerful semiconductors. And this is the easiest and best way as of now to make the best semiconductors. Not entirely. They can be used for servers. Whatever the tech companies want them to be made for, they design the chips. Those designs then get sent to manufacturers like TSMC, and TSMC orders the machines from ASML. So it depends on what TSMC wants from ASML. Mm. Yeah. So it is a level play on the security Yes. Hi, I, I, I just wanted to echo, uh, I, I thought it was a very well done presentation, very concise on a, on, a, on a somewhat complex company. Just for my own edification, interim growth rate, how, how long is that period? I assume that's the, the period before the terminal. Five year, uh, the interim growth rate period was five years. Five years, okay. And then just uh, as I'm sure you already do, um, whenever using kind of peer-based relative valuation, it, it's always helpful just to make sense or make sure there aren't outliers or that those underlying valuations of the peer group make sense as well. But I'm sure you do that already. Thank you again. Thank Very you. Very well done. Finod. I, there's a little bit of confusion here. The 13.5 nanometer wavelength is the wavelength of the machines. The actual chips, the machines that operate at 13.5 nanometers produce are down to two nanometers. It's best seen on this graph. If I could blow this up, I would. The, the 13.5 nanometer wavelength can be seen by this pink line on the graph. And at the bottom axis, we can see that it produces chips between seven nanometers and two nanometers. It's just the how, what wavelength of light they use to place the transistors. And the shorter the wavelength of light, the closer you can get the transistors together. And the transistor size is what you're talking about. Five or so, it, it depends on like the size of the fab, but yes. Yeah, and they do produce all the CPUs. So if you have a Dell laptop with a 7 series Ryzen chip like mine, that's going to be produced using ASML's machine. Because you have to, it's so much easier when a 
like a manufacturer such as TSMC uses an EUV machine to fabricate seven nanometer chips than when they use a DUV machine. On the Y axis, we can see how complex it is. And the further up you go, the further up the line goes, it becomes more complex to manufacture a semiconductor. We can see that since the pink line is lower than the blue line, that it is much easier to make a seven nanometer chip with an EUV machine than to make a seven nanometer chip with a DUV machine. I don't believe that the market's necessarily long. I think ASML is going to outperform the market. I've, they're just based on their historical growth. They have grown historically at over 20% of the past five years. And this is even through COVID. They still made big gains and they actually held on to those gains that they made during COVID. Let me see if I can go back to... There we go. So yeah, the average past five year projected CAGR was 19.5%. It has been a very growth oriented company so far. So I think they will outperform the market and not that the market is necessarily wrong. Okay. I, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying now. You're adding, you're adding infinitely more capacity. Yeah, and you don't need infinite capacity. There will so eventually, yeah, there will eventually be a decline in the demand for the machines, but I don't expect that to be in the next couple of years. And that's all backed back on AI GPUs. That is a lot, of, some of that demand is backed on AI and GPUs, but a lot of that demand is also backed off, like, what is your next generation of iPhone going to be? Those M chips are made by TSMC using ASML's machines. We're going to need a lot more iPhones than we did in 2018. We're going to need more manufacturing equipment. Any, any further questions? Okay, so this, uh, well done, by the way. And this concludes our ISM uh, for, for this time. And we will uh, be back in November. Don't forget, we have a free networking meal at Universal Joint following this, and you can ask them all the questions you want. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>